Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover the Supreme Court for Slate.com, and I think I've been doing it for 15 years. So I think, you know, I, I thank God every day that I'm accredited. I, you know, as, as um, SCOTUS blog knows as well as everyone, you know, like that, that is not something to be taken for granted. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the court website, I mean, there's just so many <laughs> places that the court can um, really meet the public halfway where it doesn't. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's interesting to me, even, you know, I was one of those people who thought that the sort of symbolic locking of the front doors was very profound. Um, because I think for the court it was like a security call and you know eight out of ten security people said better to lock the front doors but again I think that that act uh, and what it says to the public or to the public that cares about access was very profound and um, you know I just think I think that the court and that's why these speech cases are so interesting to me because I think, you know, this whole term was about sort of redefining what speech is and redefining everything as a speech, right? And I think that it is fascinating that a court that is as protective of discourse and, you know, I'm thinking of Chief Justice Roberts' language in the, in, uh, the abortion protest case where he's talking about, you know, the need to encounter opposing viewpoints and how we live in a world where we can turn the channel and close the page and shut off the website and it's so vitally important in a democracy to encounter ideas that don't comport with your own and that the court sort of writes this way about public discourse and at the same time it's like, Ah, you know, like I don't want to hear anything that offends me. And you know, people got very hyped up about the fact that there was a buffer around the court and that the court was taking down the buffer. But again, I think it was more just the symbolic act of you cannot speak eloquently about the need to encounter things that are unpleasant and awkward and you know, human and icky, and then totally barricade yourself away from anything that is unpleasant and human and icky. It just feels as though um, these, these speech rights are being written about in a way that is so not mapping on to the reality of the court in discourse with the world. And it's, you know, I mean, this is stuff that, that I've written about, Adam Liptak has written about, but just, you know, that the shrinking pool of where the clerks are coming from, the shrinking pool of where the justices are coming from, you know, the shrinking job descriptions of the people who become justice, you know, just the, the absolute narrow narrowness of life experience going into the court and the idea that you can sit there for 50, 60 years and proudly say, I don't read any of these newspapers. I don't read law reviews. <laughs> you know, I am completely immunized from contact with anything that might uh, undermine my own ideas. And to, to sort of quite proudly construct a temple to that <laughs> and lock the doors and then say, you all American people really need to talk to each other. You need to do better at that. Well, I, I mean, I think you're saying I think you're saying two slightly different things. I think you're saying there isn't necessarily an, an interconnection between you know one line of doctrine and another, right? Except that you read them as connected in understanding the institution. Right, right. No, I, and I think that's I think that's probably correct. And I think that the court right now, this hyper interest in speech is is just a really fascinating. Um, you know, I'm not nearly the sort of philosopher to, to get there. But I think it's just such an interesting representation of the anxiety around how speech and the way we speak to each other and what we speak about to each other has become just the central anxiety of life in America. And I think, you know, taking, taking uh, that Facebook threats case is just going to open a whole new, you know, really interesting uh, area of, you know, the court trying to think about threats, you know, because they feel 
as we've stipulated, under siege. And so it's an interesting, it's a really interesting question, you know, for people who feel that, and a lot of the justices feel that every minute you're alive, you're subject to you know, internet scrutiny and threats and harassment. So I, that's gonna be a very, very interesting, for me, Rorschach test of where some of these, and again, I think it's circular. I think that their anxiety about their own sense of being under siege and the way that speech assails and attacks and undermines them starts to map on to some of these areas of doctrine. And that's why I think, you know, for me, that's why um, McCullen was such a frustrating case because it's, you can't say that, you know, every speech act um, is a violent threat when it's directed at me. Uh, but when it's directed at someone trying to access a clinic, then it's just like gentle human discourse that's necessary to the republic. And I think, I, I, you know, I think it's early days and we're going to have to see how it maps out. But I think failing to connect up everything we've talked about in terms of the justices' anxiety about being out there or in there and everything we've talked about, about how they're trying to be in a private space that's inside a public space. All of that is starting to sort of filter into these cases about how they think about how Americans speak to each other. And then I think, you know, you're really in peril of funerals are, you know, safe spaces, abortion clinics are not safe spaces, the internet is not a safe space, you know, in these siloed projections of this is where important sacred things happen and this is where other things happen. And if really we're gonna start carving the world up into those spaces, shouldn't we be talking about how the justices are thinking about how their own space and their own sort of secret space inside a public space, uh, how they imagine that? I think that's collapsing. I, I, I think that's collapsing. I think, in, in fact, one good thing about the internet is I think there has been much less of a sort of Chinese wall between the purely analytic, you know, the stuff that you find at balkanization or Volokh, uh, and the opinion and, you know, what does it all mean, big picture stuff. And I, I actually credit the law professors with bringing this into the conversation because I think um, they've been they've been really I think lighting the way toward conflating that conversation it, it's you know it, you're right I think that that divide has existed in print journalism um, and I think you know I, I think one of the things that's interesting is that when you think about how television handles you know the law generally it's almost all um, that that analytic stuff there's very little opinion about the courts on TV I mean I don't mean about the law there's a lot of opinion about the law on TV but about the, the Supreme Court there's very little and I think again that maybe loops back to the the long-standing sort of tradition that this is just too hard to have an opinion on and so uh, I think it's taken a long time. I think Jeff Tubin is actually probably the model of somebody who's been able to, again, collapse the wall between opinion and analysis. But you really have to understand it in a deep, deep way uh, to be able to sort of do the opinion stuff. And I think that there was just not the space on the page uh, for a long time and certainly not the time on television to do it. So I think I think the internet has been a really good, good sort of safe harbor to practice different voices and different tones and there's a lot of bad stuff, but oh my God, there's so much great stuff. I mean, so much great that didn't exist before the internet, so. I, I think the model is, and this is why I'm sort of optimistic despite all my grousing about the TV piece of it, I think the model is that the internet is the model and that a panoply of voices doing really different things is the answer. I mean, I think people who say there's too much opinion should read analysis, and people who say the analysis is too hard and boring should read opinion. And I think, you know, we live in an amazing time. I mean, even in the span that I've covered the court, where the, the number and the array of just extraordinary talent writing about the law, the courts, about gay marriage, about, you know, capital punishment, I, we just didn't have that. And so to me, it seems like, I don't know, it's like the kid in the candy store is mad about the lemon balls, like don't eat them, you know? But there's just so much that is great that didn't exist before. And I don't think there's one 
way to write about the court and the law that is going to satisfy everyone. In fact, I don't think that any one way to write about the court and the law satisfies most people. And, you know, I think, I mean, all credit to my colleagues who do it really, really well. But there's just constant belly aching about what the media does. And no matter how much you try to write opinion, uh, just analysis, you're told that you're infusing your opinion. And no matter, you know, what your opinion is, you're always told that you don't know the facts. So I, I think, you know, you're, you're, you're in this situation where people are going to flock to what they like. And if, you know, they like Adam Liptak for, as a court correspondent, then, you know, thank God he's there. And if they want Rush Limbaugh to tell them, you know, what Hobby Lobby meant, like, well, he's there too. And uh, I, I don't mean to suggest there's an equivalency, but I think that, you know, it, it just seems to me that we are in a moment where there are such extraordinarily talented voices writing about the court and the law, and they're doing it in so many ways that to be grumpy because you don't like two of them, I don't know. <laughs>